be seated. I want you to know, I hear you singing. Uh, that was some good music, and uh, I can't sing enough. I'm not ready to be done singing yet, but it's come time for preaching. And so I hope you're encouraged in the Lord, and uh, it's a good day to sing for the Lord. I appreciate you. We're glad to have Brother Downs with us today. Brother Downs, of course, is uh, really kind of considered one of our missionaries, but, but more importantly than that, he's really our friend, isn't he? He's really uh, an extension and a part of where we're so glad when he's able to come our direction. And um, we're glad that he's able to come today. And I have asked him to come be here. I, I am, I am excited to be here. I want him to preach to me. Uh, I need a little preaching today, and we're glad again. And I know you're going to enjoy him. How many of you have never heard Brother Downs preach? All right, there are several. Trust me, when you walk out here, you will not be the same. And I mean that because of him, right? Because of this guy's crazy. <laughs> Is that a good way to say that? He's crazy for the Lord, right, Brother Dan? That's right. I love him to death. He's a dear friend. Brother Dan, you come. Welcome to Southwinds again. You don't really need to welcome. You're a part of us. Come on. Preach to us. We're glad you're here, brother. Enjoy the great Yeah, I'm a nut, but I'm screwed on. Amen. That's exactly right. I want us to begin with uh, lifting up um, the folks in California. Amen. And all of us are just grieved when we watch the images coming out of California right now. And somebody that uh, had recently moved from here, I got word this morning, uh, Brother Leitner um, lost everything as well. He was had his possessions in the car. They evidently pulled him over and said, you need to get out of the car and run as fast as you can. And um, so let's lift those folks up in prayer right now if we... And Father God, we come to you right now as a church calling upon you, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation. And Lord, we want to stand in the gap right now for some folks that have no idea where they're going to live. They've lost everything. And more importantly, Lord, for those that have lost loved ones in this fire, we ask God that you please, we know, Lord, that you're groaning right now along with them. And we pray, God, that you would assemble your church out there, your people, that Holy Spirit, you would guide and direct in the churches out west to be able to come up under these folks. And may they be a conduit of your love, of your grace, of your mercy. We just pray, Father, right now that you would help those that have questions. Help those, Father, that are hurting physically, mentally, and more important, spiritually. Lord, we know that you can turn the curse into a blessing. Only you can do that. That, Father God, you can reach into a situation where there is no hope and bring hope that you can reach into a situation where there are no answers and give a peace. So, Lord, we pray that you would somehow or another take this and use this in some lives on the West Coast is our prayer now. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Psalm 92, 1, it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. Amen. amen. And this week... Particular Thanksgiving week, we take time out of our lives to to just have a spirit of thanksgiving, and and uh, but it ought to be that way every day for believers. Amen? Amen. We've got much to be thankful about, and so um, the Bible says, as Pastor already quoted, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning all of us, and so. I just want to begin um, by saying to Southwinds Baptist Church, um, and Ann couldn't be here today. She, uh, she ate some of her own cooking. And, no, I'm just teasing. Um, well, this isn't being recorded, is it? Um, but I want to thank this church. You know, we have been through some stuff together. And as this church sailed into some very difficult times, 
And I myself personally was sailing into some stuff that blindsided me. Um, I got a call um, to come fill this pulpit um, while we were looking for a pastor. And um, God knew exactly what this church needed. Man. And uh, always said, can any good thing come out of Viter? <laughs> well, here he is. Amen. <laughs> And uh, God blessed our time of many of you fasted and prayed. We prayed and we sought God uh, through those. And y'all endured my preaching for I don't know how long it was. Mark, do you remember how long? Way too long. Wait, watch it now. Watch it. I rebuke him in the name of Jesus over there. Um, I asked Mark, I tell you, some people are a blessing when they come and some are a blessing when they go. Do you have anything else you can go do right now? Okay. <laughs> Most of you know that um, just a few months ago, I, I had just got done preaching, and um, I thank God I just got out of jail to be here today, but I was preaching in the jail. And, you know, I always feel, I, I, when I preach here, I feel right at home, right? I'm normally preaching to inmates, and so, you know, when you got people like Dwight Goodson in the audience, uh, and I feel like I'm right at home preaching in the jail, amen? And uh, some real characters here, but... Um, I um, had a brother there at, at the jail. I call him my mahogany brother. He comes in and, and we preach together and, and uh, we went out to lunch and um, we went to Cleburne's Cafeteria. I'll never forget it. And, um, and it, was a day, it was a beautiful day. It was March the 1st. And uh, we went to Cleburne's Cafeteria. They just opened it. And I ate a massive chicken fried steak, which I shouldn't have ever done. We were headed back to the jail, and I told Brother Johnny, I said, hey, Brother, I tell you what, um, let me out down here, about a mile from the jail. I'm going to walk back to the jail. Had a service at 1 o'clock. And my phone rang. And... Um, it was my son's best friend. Um, and he called me and said, Mr. Downs, this is Anthony, and um, I'm going to send you a picture that I just saw on the news. It was a picture of my son's car. And um, I had actually been on the phone with the medical examiner that morning. I had an inmate that um, lost his mother and I had to call the medical examiner to verify that it was indeed the case. And when I looked at that picture, I knew it was my son's car. And I went online and I saw the driver was deceased. And I'm going to tell you, I don't remember what happened after that. I don't remember going back to the jail. I did have to call the medical examiner. And found out that John had graduated and um, I um, and y'all prayed him through a lot my son was in John was in some of the fiercest fighting in Iraq he was in the battle of Satter City and um, and of course um, he was in a striker unit over there he saw a lot of death they were in firefights every day and um, and this church prayed my son through all that and I'm, I'm a debtor this morning, and I, I just wanted to say um, thank you for praying for my son. And God gave us 10 years after um, he got back, and uh, good, good years. And so on behalf of Ann and myself and, and Laurel, we just, I, we just want to say um, thank you. And many of you sent cards. I've saved all the cards, and, and just to know that you were praying for us um, through that. Um, and God has used it in my own life um, in a huge way. He takes that. God takes, we know that all things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And he's used it for his glory already. And y'all have prayed, but I want to say don't stop praying, particularly 
for Ann and Laurel and just lift them up in prayer that God would continue to strengthen them and comfort them and um, through this. And so, I, I, again, I, I don't have the words to say. Um, just thank you for standing with us. Thank you for standing with me as I go back in to the very jail where I was incarcerated. And I always tell the inmates, y'all are trying to get out. I'm trying to get in. Amen. And uh, I love being in that jail or in prison. I love the jail more than I do prison because it's where I was. And many of those men in that jail have really never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. That's why I love it so much. I say it's like shooting chickens on the yard down there. I'm telling you. I mean, I caught a couple of kids breaking into the chaplain's office the other day. I mean, I came around the corner and I'm, I'm not making up. They were breaking into the office. I mean, two uh, young African-American kids, probably one was 18, the other one I think was 17. I said, what are y'all doing? Get inside there. Boy, I, I got them inside. I said, they're watching y'all on the camera right now. I said, get in here. And man, I spent about one hour. I said, what tank are y'all? What cell block y'all? I called the, the cell block. I said, listen, I got a couple of guys right now in the office, in the chaplain's office here. And I'm going to have them for a little bit. Amen. <laughs> and I proceeded to fill them both full of gospel bullets. And one of them uh, wasn't ready. Wasn't ready to receive the Lord. But the other one. Neither of these kids knew their dad. And uh, neither of these kids had nobody in their life. These kids are mad. And what we're seeing in this nation right now is the breakdown of the family. And uh, I mean, the results of the breakdown of the family, the results of leaving God, the results of not being thankful for what God's done. When you read the account in Romans chapter one, we think about Thanksgiving. It talks about how <clears throat> in Romans one, they were able to see creation. And we see that they they began to rationalize away God they rejected God and in that in that in that steps of reprobation in Romans chapter 1 it says and neither were they thankful and that's where we're at in America right now ingratitude grins in the face of an angry God this morning in this country and the Lord's going to step in but every day I feel almost guilty I get to see people come to Christ because God is working. He dwells, the Bible says the Lord dwells with those that are a broken and contrite spirit. And so thank you for helping me go and just share what, how God delivered me through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That he saved me from the penalty of sin, the power, he's saving me from the power of sin, and I will yet be saved from the presence of sin when he comes back soon. Amen? That's my message. It's the gospel. I'm a gospel preacher of grace. I'm saved by grace, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. I'm kept by grace. I'm not keeping myself safe. Romans 5, 1 says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access into that grace wherein we stand. Grace keeps you. It will keep you. We are sustained by grace. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 12. I don't know what you're going through this morning, but I'm going to tell you, the grace of God will sustain you through the trials. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Please pray for Lighthouse Prison Ministries. And when you do pray, um, we're getting ready to try to take over that jail, starting with one floor. For the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, um, y'all need to bathe. Please bathe this in prayer. 
is we've got the okay. Um, you know, in TDC, they have faith-based dorms and uh, faith-based dorms in many of the prisons, not all of them are nothing but more than a joke because you have a mixture of beliefs and there's all kinds of just, I mean, inmates are mi as mixed up as a termite and a yo-yo in those things. So we're trying to have dormitories where we're preaching the pure, unadulterated grace of God. And so we're going to start on the fourth floor, the 701 facility where we have uh, 5,000 men incarcerated. And so y'all please pray about that. All right. And uh, it could be that I'm going to call upon some men in this church uh, to be willing to go inside the cell block and sit down with these guys and maybe do a Bible study. So please be praying that God will give me wisdom as we try to put this together and that God will give us. We're going to need great favor to do this. We're thankful for what God is doing. We now have several houses in Spring Branch area where men that are getting out of prison. These are, you know, halfway houses. A lot of these guys who give their life to God while they're locked up. And uh, I know there's uh, inmates, former inmates right now that are sitting in this audience that would verify what I'm talking about. I talked to one earlier that I met in the Harris County Jail. And, um, you know, as a heroin addict, Back in the 70s, when I got out of jail, I had no place to go. I had to go right back to the same environment. And so it's always been a burden of mine to be able to have a safe place where the Word of God is taught, where the men go to church, where they're connected uh, with Bible studies on a regular basis. And now uh, it all started with a guy that came to Christ in my service in 1993 in the Harris County Jail. He was one of the largest cocaine dealers in uh, Houston area. And um, he got saved and uh, he got out. He, he went to prison. He got out and now he's got six six houses that he has purchased in Spring Branch. And um, his name is David Trickett, a friend of mine. I told him, I said, brother, let me tell you something. Sometimes I ask people to pray about supporting me. I'm telling you right now, you will support my ministry. Amen. You came to Christ. And, uh, and, and so he helps me out quite a bit. When I need a bed for a guy, I've got a bed. Amen. Amen. So thank you for praying and thank you for helping me with that. And another thing I want you to pray about. Um, I want to speak to the sheriff, Ed Gonzalez. And I want to start something for the victims of crime. This has been a burden on my heart. A lot is being done for the inmates. Very little is being done for the victims. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, God, the Holy Spirit has been keeping me awake at night over this. And so I'm going to go to him, Lord willing, this week with the, the guy that's director of chaplaincy in the jail down there. And um, I want to do something about that. And I'm talking about a, a Christ-centered uh, ministry to the victims of crime. So please, those are just some things you can pray about um, as we continue the work. I want you to open your Bibles this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Um, somebody help Mark find that. That's New Testament, Mark. Okay. He, he, he found it. He's got those tabs on his Bible over there, so he found it real quick. Um, I'm doing a series right now with inmates just on favorite chapters of the Bible. I mean... I, I, <laughs> You know, I thank the Lord in 1978 uh, when a judge, he didn't even know he was doing it. But, uh, you know, the Lord is supernaturally superintending over the affairs of our life. Amen. That's the providence of God. And uh, on my eighth felony standing in a courtroom, uh, they were going to give me 20 years in the Texas Department of Corrections. But God came in the courtroom and began to do some stuff and some hearts. And I got court ordered. To an island 40 miles south of Corpus Christi. It was a, well, they had dredged this huge canal back in the 40s called the Intercoastal Waterway, and they piled up the dirt and made all these man made islands. 
And so an old preacher by the name of Lester Roloff, old brother Roloff, he, was, he just loved knuckleheads. And I qualified. Amen. He only took the worst, literally, brother Roloff only took the worst criminals, the ones the state couldn't fix, because they can't fix anybody. Amen. And they put me on that island. Judge Myron Love. That's a great name for a judge, isn't it? I'm so glad I had Judge Love. And, and he put me down in Corpus Christi. And the program down there was called the You Will Program. And it went like this. You will do exactly what we tell you to do. They had an airborne ranger running that place. And uh, they had an obstacle course down there. And if you got caught cussing, you got caught talking about your old life, you got caught singing rock and roll music, I mean, you got caught fighting, then you ran. And I mean, I was ready for the Olympics. I mean, one month into it, I was, I was running. But they also had a scripture memory program, and we had to memorize a chapter of the Bible every month, Pastor. Every month. Now, you got to understand, when I got to the lighthouse, that was the name of it. I mean, I, I, I looked like death eating a cracker. I mean, I was, my life, I had, I had shot so much heroin, taken so much LSD when I was 12 years old. I mean, there wasn't much left of me. But the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a brand new creation. Old things pass away, but all things. Be but I began to memorize the scripture. I didn't have a choice. If you didn't have your, your chapter memorized, you had to go run. So they started real easy. They started with, uh, started with Psalm 1. That was the first chapter. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law do he meditate day and night, and he'll be like a tree. Planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Amen. Psalm 8, Psalm 19. I'm going to give you some, these are, these are chapters of memorized. Let me encourage you. If you have a favorite chapter, memorize it. I can give you some of mine right now. Colossians 3. That's a great chapter to memorize. James chapter 1. Psalm 1. Psalm 8. Psalm 19. Psalm 27. Psalm 34. These will change your life. Psalm 37. A chapter every person in this church needs to memorize. Psalm 51. That's the way home. Amen? It's a great chapter. Psalm 91. Psalm 100. Psalm 103. Great chapters. Anybody got a favorite chapter right now? You say, Brother Downs, this is, I love this chapter. It's my favorite chapter in the Bible. Anybody got one? Yes, ma'am. Psalm 103, great, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is with me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. What a chapter. That's a great chapter. Anybody else got a favorite chapter? Yes, ma'am. What is it? Psalm 100, that's an awesome, he... He is. We're the sheep of his pasture. Amen. He's our shepherd. That's a great one. And that's a, that's one. It's a, that's a good one to start with right there. Psalm 27. What a chapter. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength and my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? What a chapter. I had fainted unless I'd believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Whew. That'll make a Methodist shout right there, amen? I'm going to tell you, that's a great chapter. So let me encourage you to get you some chapters in the hard drive, amen?
Somebody asked me that you on Facebook. How come you ain't on Facebook, Brother Downs? I said, because I'm trying to keep my face in the book. Amen. <laughs> I ain't got time for Facebook. What you talking about? <laughs> By the way, and also people are still looking for me. I ain't getting on Facebook. Amen. <laughs> I ran with some crazy people, man. You think I'm getting on Facebook? <laughs> I'm worried that Brother Clayton might show up at my door or something. I don't know. <laughs> I know he's not on Facebook. Amen. <laughs> he may be. I don't know. Look at him back there. Grinning like a goat eating briars back there. Amen. <laughs> this is one of my favorite chapters. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Actually, I love the whole book. And let me just say this, brothers and sisters in Christ. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Okay? And it's profitable for doctrine. That's what is right. For reproof tells us what is wrong. For correction tells us how to get right. And for instruction it tells us how to stay right. But I'm going to tell you, and all the Bible is important, but we need to master the epistles. We need as Christians to master the epistles. Or should I say, let them master us. Amen. <laughs> let me back up. If you're talking about I study, I'm studying the Bible, you better let it study you. Amen. Right. And this is a great epistle, the epistle to the Corinthian church. This is a messed up people in this church. Amen. That's right. God is writing the church at Corinth. And he says in 2 Corinthians 4, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we receive mercies, circle these words, we faint not. But I've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Thank God y'all have an expository preacher. He is very rare. He is not a feel-good preacher. Huh? Oh, no. He's preaching the whole counsel of God. He ain't going to be up here talking about, I'm okay and you're okay. It's all good. No, he's going to preach the whole council. Somebody asked me today, you're not one of those hellfire brimstone people, are you? I said, well, I'm going to get that in there because it's the whole council of God. Amen. Turn or burn, baby. <laughs> That's right. God is still holy. Amen. He is still just. That's right. And one of his attributes is justice. He's a just God. Oh, he's not winking at sin. Sin must be atoned for. That's what the cross is all about. Right. Yeah. People walking around wearing these crosses. It's gorgeous, isn't it? Man, it's an instrument of death. What are you talking about, gorgeous? Nobody got off a Roman cross. Somebody had to, grace is free, but it wasn't cheap. Amen? We've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craft, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Who's the God of this world? Satan. He's at work. One devil, many demons. Huh. No new devils, but I'm going to tell you, new levels. Come to jail with me. They call them predator tanks now. Oh yeah, we got a bunch of them now. Predator tanks. Men with reprobate minds. Unable to retain God in their minds. Mm -hmm. We're reaping now. America is sown to the wind. We're reaping the whirlwind right now. And Billy Graham was right many years ago when he said, if God doesn't judge the United States of America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. This nation is spit in the face of God Almighty. And if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your, your servants for Jesus' sake. 
For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure, that is we believers, have this treasure in earthen vessels, clay pots, that's who we are, cracked pot right there, cracked pot, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side. Now watch this. This is where we're at today. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our mortal body, in our body. That's a great statement. He repeats it in the next verse. For we which live always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest or seen in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We have in the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also by Jesus and shall present us with you for all things and for your sakes the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Amen. And then these great verses which ought to be committed to memory. For which cause we faint not, though, for though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. While we look not at the things which are seen... For our light affliction, which but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. But the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen. The Bible begins with perfection. Genesis 1. The Bible ends with perfection. In the book of Revelation, chapter 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. We are living between those two bookends right now. We are living in a fallen world. The Bible says in Job 14, 1, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation. Anybody got that for a life verse? That's a promise. I had no idea on March 1st when I was walking down that street and I got that call that that was coming. Some of you right now are in the midst of something you never, ever dreamed would happen or are prepared for because we live in a fallen world. We live, the Bible says in Proverbs 24, 10, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. We are living in the days of adversity right now. And so Paul is writing to these believers and he's warning them twice he says the statement, verse 1, do not faint. Verse number 16, do not faint. And I just want to encourage us as the church as brothers and sisters in Christ to finish good for God. Many of us are going to be involved in some serious trials and tribulations. <laughs> We're living in tribulation right now. Not the great tribulation, but Peter said in 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, that's us, that's, that's you, you're beloved. Don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you so in the time we have left I want to from this chapter and I've never preached on this chapter before it's been one of my favorite chapters but this is my first time I've ever preached on it I want to preach on avoiding spiritual fainting spirit.
spells because nobody's immune to it. Nobody's immune. Paul is writing to defend his ministry. If anybody could have quit, it could have been Paul. Amen? Now, here's a guy that got stoned to death. Now, I'm not talking about, uh, he didn't get stoned, amen? He got hit by rocks. All right? And many commentators believe that he actually died. When he went to the third heaven, he's talking about it in 2 Corinthians. <laughs> I, you know, I, I just kind of think Paul's like, Lord, really? I've got to come back? Yep. Got some, some for you, something else for you to do. Paul said, I have a desire to depart and be white. If, if, I mean, everywhere he went and preached, she got locked up. Oh, yeah, he had a jail ministry. Amen. Oh, yeah. Chained to the guards. Stoned. Left for dead. But he didn't quit. And he's saying, listen, don't faint. Church, don't faint. Don't faint. If you faint, Proverbs 24, 10, in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Avoiding spiritual fainting spells. Number one, look at verse number one again. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. Whenever you're reading the Bible, and by the way, you always ought to have a pen in your hand. When you, op when you open up the Word of God, the voice of God is heard. Do you understand how important that is? When you open up your Bible, how many of you know this from Pastor? And I, I know that Pastor, he covers a lot of Scripture when he preaches. How many of you have ever not even been listening to him, but you got something from the Word of God when he was up here preaching? Amen? That's right. Why? Because you're looking at the Bible. You're looking at the Word of God. And he gets so boring. <laughs> Good to be able to have that Bible. Whenever you see a therefore in the scripture, you need to ask yourself, what is the therefore, therefore? What, what, I, he says, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, what ministry? Well, you got to go back to the preceding chapters. Preceding chapter, preceding verses. He's saying we, and I know that Paul is vindicating his ministry because some people were accusing him of some stuff. But this is for all of us. God has a calling on all of our lives. We are all. Back up to chapter 3 and look at it. He says, listen, he says, writing to these Christians in Corinth, verse number 2, you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. You know what Paul just said? You're the only Bible that's, that most people will ever read. You are the only Bible that your neighbors, your co-workers will ever read. What kind of version are you? Huh? Are you a perversion? Or can people look at your life and say, man, I don't know where you got that peace. I saw how you responded in that situation. I noticed that you, you never cheat on your time. You are here on time and on and on. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, it says in verse number six, he has made us able ministers of the New Testament. He said in chapter five, we are ambassadors. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Isn't it amazing that God has chosen to use you? Do you know that George W. Truett, I went to a Bible conference a few years ago out in California out there um, Paul whatever his name is chapel and you know I, I'm going to be honest with you I didn't get a whole lot out of the conference but one thing I the main thing I brought back it was just a little plaque on a wall and it said it was a quote by George W. Truett and it said the highest human achievement attainable is to bring another man to Christ took a picture of it 
There's nothing greater you can do. And by the way, the only reason God is leaving us here right now is to be his ambassadors. And so there's a lot at stake. There, when, when we consider not fainting, remember, count the cost. There is a lot at stake here. When David fell into sin, King David, a man after God's own heart, one of the saddest verses in all of Scripture is when Nathan the prophet comes to David and he says, look here, bro, modern version here. Hey, tells him the story. And he knew that David had taken another man's wife. Not only that, but he actually had the, the, the husband murdered and David lost his testimony. And he said, David, that verse in, there in Samuel, because of what you've done, you've given great occasion for the enemies of God to blaspheme. Well, people are watching us. Guard your testimony. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, we faint not. We renounce. Look at verse number two. How do you keep, keep from fainting? Renounce the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word. Just be real. Be authentic. You know, what, you know what people are looking for? They're looking for authenticity. And this, what they're seeing in the church right now is a bunch of phony, baloney nonsense. Let's just be real. We live in a fallen world. Let's don't act like, you know what, we're hurt. Let's act like God made us. We're humans. We groan. We hurt when bad things happen. People get sick. People, good godly people get cancer. And you got this large part of the church saying, in the name of, it's, you're out of God's will, you got sick. And all this other nonsense. The world is looking and saying, let's be real. Let's guard our hearts. It says we renounce hidden things of dishonesty. The Bible says we need to guard our hearts. One of, the, one of the men that was executed when I was on death row was a guy by the name of Ron Schember. I remember Ron, when I got to death row in 1997, as a chaplain, I had Bible study every Friday night. Back then they let us have chapel with them. And I had about 35 guys coming to chapel every Friday night. And the guy leading my singing, it was, it was awesome. We sang all the old hymns. Our theme song was Like a River Glorious is God's Perfect Peace. What a song. And Ron Schamberger led the singing. Ron, blonde hair, blue eyes, looked like he just stepped out of a Christian school. A student at A&M University committed one of the most heinous crimes, killed a very, very precious girl. Anybody remember the story? Ron and I got real close. He's home now. I, met, I'm, I know his parents. Ron wrote me a testimony that I used to talk to young people. But he said in his testimony, he said, John, you know, he was raised in a Christian home, a Southern Baptist home, went to church three times a week. He traveled all over the nation singing with the choir from his church. He loved the Lord with all his heart. He was helping with the youth group at the time of the crime there in College Station. After he, got, he got, after he killed the girl, beautiful girl, called his youth pastor to come pick him up and take him to the police station. He said, Brother Downs, it started by not guarding my heart. It started by little bitty stuff that I began to do, that I began to look at. And the heart, the Bible says in Jeremiah 70, is deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. 
Let's guard, let's renounce the hidden. Nobody else knows, God knows. Renounce the hidden things of this, not walking in craftiness, in deceit. Don't be living a lie. Come to Psalm 51 and say, oh God, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil. Have mercy upon me, oh God, according to thy loving kindness. There's a lot at stake. There's a lot at stake. Your family members, their souls are at stake. We need to not faint in these days spiritually. Renounce sin. Renounce it. Do not give place to the devil. Confess your sin. Keep a, keep a clean slate. I mean, we are in the midst of, of warfare. Spurgeon put it this way. We look down and we see the devil. He's tempting us constantly. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, power, spiritual wickedness. We look, we see the enemy coming at us. We look at the, we look around us and we see the world alluring us and tempting us and not, with nothing really evil just to keep us out of this book. Oh yeah, I mean, no new tricks, just new sticks. If he can keep you out of the word of God. <laughs> Then we look within us and we see, Lord, you know what? I'm really, I'm living a lie. And we look up and we see God is, he's, he's not going to leave us the same. He's correcting us and he is perfecting us, conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ. That's a good thing. Amen. That's a wonderful thing. The conviction of the Holy Spirit. Obey it when it comes. Don't resist the Spirit. Don't grieve the Spirit. Deal with it. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to cleanse us. To forgive us and to cleanse us from our sin. Keep the pathway clear. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. You're an ambassador for Christ. Don't faint. Don't get sidetracked. Avoid fainting. I could, we could have Brother Clayton. Brother Clayton could come up here right now and for six hours tell you about great Christians that he knew that have fallen completely away from the Lord. I guarantee you he could. They fainted. They quit. They gave up. We, we sung it this morning. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And if you think you're beyond that, you've been hoodwinked by the enemy. You need to be abiding in Christ on a daily basis. This is wonderful church Sunday morning, but it'll never replace your quiet time with God Amen. on a daily basis. It'll never replace it. As pastor said earlier, this is a booster shot. This is a booster shot right now. This is confirmation for what you read all week long. Count the cost. People are watching you. Number two, renounce sin. Number three, abide in the word. It says neither we, <laughs> look at verse two. We haven't handled the word of God deceitfully. Here's reference twisting the scriptures, but it could be neglecting the scriptures. Let me call you back today. Maybe you've drifted away from the Bible. Let me call you back from personal time in the Word of God. Whatever that looks like for you, all of us are different. But I, I'd encourage you to begin a program of scripture memory. There's nothing, there's not a greater Christian discipline. Then engrafting the word of God into your soul. Now I'm going to tell you, I would not be standing in this pulpit this morning having gone through. And I, I, like I tell the inmates, I'll go one on one with anybody in the room on an abusive childhood. Both of my parents were alcoholics. 
And I watched my dad die in the middle of a drunken brawl in my arms as a 15-year-old boy. I went through so much abuse as a young boy. I can't even, I don't even have the words for it. The guy that led me to the Lord, Brother Roloff, my spiritual father died. I mean, I've been through, but I'm going to tell you what's carried me. I lost my son. The thing that's carried me is the Word of God that I grafted. Right. Verses, chapters that I hadn't, that I had not reviewed, Pastor, for years as I was laying in bed, weeping, the Holy Spirit retrieved them. He said, here you go, boy. Here you go. Psalm 20 said, here you go. Here's a little something, something for you. Amen. How about that one? And I'm thinking, man, I can quote that word perfect. I haven't quoted, I haven't reviewed that verse in a long time, uh, those, those, those chapters in a long time. If they're not in the hard drive, there won't be there. Right. Wherewithal shall I amen? By taking heed. Thy word have I hid my heart that I might not sin against thee. James 1 said, listen, every good gift, every perfect gift, that's, to me it's talking about the Word of God. Because it says in there, receive with meekness the Word. Be reverent about this Bible. Don't neglect the Word of God. Or you're going to faint. You're going to faint. You're going to faint if you begin to look around at the world right now. Don't you love watching the news? Isn't that a blessing? <laughs> well, if I really want to get happy, I just watch the news. Now, I'm going to tell you, you watch enough of the news, you're going to be, you're going to lose your mind if you're not in this book right here. If you don't understand that people are blind, I'm going to tell you, you think I'd be doing prison ministry if I didn't understand that? I mean, there's some characters in there. There's some people. I had a guy tell me something in my office down at that jail that was so gross that I, I, I couldn't even walk, Pastor. It was beyond, and I've heard a lot of crazy stuff coming out of what I came out of. But I just thought to myself, blind, blind. And if we're not going to faint, we need to understand. If our gospel is hid, it is hid to them who are lost and whom the God of this world have blinded the minds. Don't get angry. Pray for them. Amen? Don't get frustrated. The things are exactly what happens to lost people and to nations that have turned their back on God. Guard yourself. If you get angry, you let anger and unforgiveness... Somebody did you wrong? You got to understand, they've been blinded by the enemy. Their eyes have been punched out. And so you begin to pray, or you're going to faint. You're going to faint. Stay humble that God has chosen. He says, we're, we're his vessels. God chose, he said, we are, we are earthen vessels. God has made us. You can reach somebody I could never reach. For me, it's drug addicts. I love a room full of dope heads. I'm, I'm right at home. That's terrible, isn't it? No, it's awesome to have a guy say, bro, you're the first. I've been a heroin. I had one tell me Friday, bro, you're the, I've been on heroin for 30 years. You're the first man I've ever seen get free. I said, you can't get free. Jesus has to make you free. Amen? Where, what chapter did I take him to? If you know the truth, and the truth will what? Me? Took him to John 8. But I, I said, brother, let me tell you something. The Bible doesn't say the truth will make you free. The Bible says if you continue in my word, <laughs> then you'll know the truth. Then the truth will make you free. You've got to abide in the word. And so... You got some people that you can talk to that I can't talk to. So don't faint. Don't faint. Go get you one. Amen? Go get you one. Everyone can win one. Remember that God is with us. He says, We're troubled, verse 8, on every side, yet not distress. Verse 8. These are great verses. We are perplexed. How many of you are perplexed? Just tell the truth and shame the devil. All of us ask why. I mean, there, there's not, if you're human, 
a lot of times you're going to say, Lord, what's, what's going on here? No one understand exactly. We're not going to understand everything until we get home. Amen? But no, we know the big picture. People are blinded. This sin has done a thorough job. But we do know that even though we're perplexed, even though we're even though we are in the word in the word there where it says we're troubled on every side you know what that says that that means we're we're pressed like a grape in a wine press just remember god is with you i remember when my son died brother pope called me and just said brother just praying for you remember he who walks with god is never alone amen, amen. He who walks with God is never alone. And if you walk with God, you'll always get to the right destination. Okay? Never forget that. If you'll just keep walking with God, you, you may be down. It says right there, we are, we are cast down, but not destroyed. You ever been knocked down? I was knocked down on March the 1st. Pastor, I was down. He's on the mat. The old devil, he's down. We got him. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm back up. Amen? Amen. Well, wow, word of God. Grace of God. Prayers of God's people. Don't faint. Don't faint. Keep going. Keep going. God is with us. He said, I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. And we need to focus on the finish line. That's the chapter ends with that. Let me tell you something. Like Tozer says, the only real world is the world to come. This is not real. The only real world is the one to come. This is very temporary. Like I used to tell the guys on death row, cheer up, you'll soon be dead. I used to tell them that. Boy, some of them were like, hey, bro, what? Do what? That's right. Last time I checked, one out of one people going to die. That's what the stats tell us. Did you know that? They did a study on it and they determined that one out of every one person is going to die. <laughs> oh yeah, we're all on death row. The mom says it's appointed in the man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. And so we are now living days of adversity, but it's also the day of grace. This is the church age. That's what it's called. The church age. It started... With the death and the resurrection of Christ. And it's going to end with what the Bible calls the catching away. When Christ comes. That's where we're at right now. My question to you today. As we conclude. Where are you? Now that's the first question in the Bible, isn't it? That's the first question. Did God ask Adam? Hey, boy, where are you? It wasn't because God was like, where'd he go? No. It's a spiritual question. Where are you? Where are you at right now with God? We're not talking about being a Baptist. We're not talking about being a Methodist. We're not talking about being a Catholic. We're talking about where are you in regard to the finished work of Christ? This is a gospel church you're in this morning. Okay, that is, the gospel is defined in 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty for sin. He said, I got the debt. I went out to eat at Papado's. I like Papado's. Can I get an amen? Okay, when I eat seafood, that's where I go. Anybody feel led to give me a gift card to Papado's? Don't quench the spirit. Okay, don't, don't, as the old black preacher said, don't squinch him. Amen. Don't squinch him. But man, I ate, and I'm going to tell you, I ate, Ann and I ate, and ate. I even got dessert, and I knew the bill was going to be pretty high. So, but when I asked for my check, uh, the waiter, he said, no, you're good, man. You're, you're, you're you're, you're good to go. I said, no, I need my check, bro. He said, no, I'm telling you, you're good to go. I said, what are you talking about? He said, a couple right over there in the corner, they asked for your check. I said, well, hey, you go tell them I pay my own way. I ain't nobody paying my, you think I said that? I mean, I went over there and said, hey, how often y'all come here, amen? What? We meet here every week. He said, man, Brother Downs, 
I wish that would happen to me. It did 2,000 years ago. You owed a tab you couldn't pay. The wages of sin is death. Christ paid a tab he did not owe. He said, it is finished. I have paid everything that was prophesied hundreds of years before about the one that would come and be the ultimate sacrifice. All of the Old Testament pointed, all the sacrifices, all the bloods pointed to the atoning work of Christ. And it's so simple, the smart alecks miss it. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved or delivered. It's that simple. Don't miss it. You said, Brother Nelson, I hadn't, I hadn't been in a church in years. Well, you picked a good day to come to church. You can drive a stake in the ground and make sure that you know. These, the Bible says these things are written that you may know that you have everlasting life. If you're here today and you stood before God today, you stood before the Lord. And he was to say, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? There's only one answer. Lord, I believed in your death, your burial, and your resurrection. And I accepted you as my sacrifice. And if you haven't done that, I'm not trying to put you on. I just, I'm just telling you, that's one thing you need to nail down. You need to, you can know that you know that you know that on, what's today, the 18th, what is it? The 8th, that on November the 18th, I did business with God. Not you became a Baptist, or you, that you became a blood-bought believer in Christ. And that's settled. Not based upon your performance, based upon His performance. That's grace. That's Bible. If you're here today, nail it down. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you today for the cross. We thank you today for grace. You doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. Thank you, Lord, that you paid the price, that you shed your blood, that you went all the way and didn't turn back. Help us not to turn back. Help us not to faint. And I pray, Lord, if there be one here today, perhaps maybe somebody that is just here, they wandered in, driving by. Lord, I pray right now, please, God, just draw them in and give them the courage. And you're here today, you say, Brother Downs, pray for me. You're, I think that I'm here because God put me here just for this today. I'm not ready to meet God. Please pray for me, Brother Downs. Anybody like that? Raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Right? Anybody like that? I'm not ready, but I want to get ready. Anybody? Father, again, be with us now. Help us to finish strong for thee now. Help us in Christ's name. Amen.